Thank you very, very much, Hannah. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm just really pleased and honored to be here at this historic venue um, and grateful to all of you for taking time from a beautiful evening to come um, here and join a discussion about the vagina. Um, and I can only imagine the social conversations with your friends or partners or dates that led up to that. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, the, the discoveries, uh, which to me were quite extraordinary, mind-blowing discoveries um, that I've shared in, in uh, my book, Vagina. And before I go into those, I'm just going to say um, that it's getting easier, but it's not completely 100%. I'm not completely used to saying vagina, 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 vagina <laughs> in a beautiful public setting like this, although it helps that it looks like a pink jewel box. <laughs> um, and one example of this uh, evolution of mine is that I went into the lobby of my apartment building in New York recently, and in America, the publishers put big labels with the book title on boxes when they ship books. And my publisher had shipped me a box of books. And my doorman came out and looked at me in some consternation. And there was a giant cardboard box with a giant label that said vagina. <laughs> he said, is this yours? <laughs> I had to say yes. <clears throat> um, but uh, but it's, it's, it's getting easier and easier. And the most, well, you'll hear um, why it's worth habituating myself to sharing um, this information and saying this word because what we're going to see tonight is that uh, we're just coming into a new era that could take us out of 5,000 years of darkness, um, insult, benightedness about our own female sexuality, but also our, our very female consciousness itself. And you'll see what I mean. So the headlines I'm going to walk you through tonight are, um, number one, that female desire is an innately transgressive force. And it's also a lens through which all cultures have kind of projected their fears and anxieties about women. Um, but another kind of incredible, uh, astonishing set of facts that I found in my research for my book is that there's cutting-edge new neuroscience, which has not been widely reported, that's mostly in academic journals, um, that shows that female sexuality is not only very different from male sexuality, but even different, very different, from what the conventional wisdom since Masters and Johnson, um, you know, conventional wisdom that you might pick up in a woman's magazine or in uh, discussions about sexuality in the culture, um, have, have believed, have led us to believe. Uh, huge new discoveries. And um, the third is that this misunderstanding of female desire and sexuality and of the vagina has led to a situation which in spite of you know, 30 or 40 years of the quote unquote sexual revolution, it's not working for a lot of women, right? The sexual revolution is not liberating a lot of women into their fullest <coughs> potential and self-understanding. 30% of women self-report um, Technical term is hypoactive sexual desire, low sexual desire, not, be, not wanting it very much, not, not finding it, it's not working for them. And another 30%, some of them the same women, some different, report, self-report that they don't always reach orgasm during lovemaking. So um, what we'll see tonight, what we'll learn tonight, really goes a long way to explaining why that is and what, you know, what can easily be changed about it. So I should tell you, you know, why I came to want to think about the vagina. Um, I've always been interested in female sexuality and in the history of female sexuality. Um, and I thought when I began working on this book that if I looked at the history um, and the culture uh, around the vagina, I would be able to find some truth about what the vagina really is. Um, by studying all of our social constructs. I thought some would prove to be basically accurate um, and others deeply inaccurate. But now I see that all of the current constructs that we have about the vagina in our culture uh, are only partially true and some are really wrong and full of disinformation. Is the vagina a pathway to enlightenment 
as it was for uh, Indian practitioners of the Tantra, or a golden lotus, as Chinese Tao philosophy maintained? Is it the whole with multiple meanings that the Elizabethans saw it as being? Or the test site for female maturity, an organ whose response separates the women from the girls, as Sigmund Freud believed? Um, or is it what American feminists from the 70s on claim it to be, a not so important organ subordinated to the more glamorous clitoris? Or is it what contemporary mass-produced pornography says it is, a hot but essentially interchangeable orifice, available visually by the thousands to anyone with a modem? Or is it what right on sex positive 2000s post-feminism says it is, a zippy pleasure producer for lusty women that demands dial-up satiation from the texting of random partners to booty calls um, to high-tech vibrating electronics? Uh, what is it, right? Many, many versions. So I read books such as evolutionary biologists Christopher Ryan and Casilda Jetha's Sex at Dawn. I reread Share Height. Uh, I read The Story of V, A Natural History of Female Sexuality by a cultural historian, Catherine Blackledge. And I looked at the latest research on female orgasm from scientific databases in the archives of human reproduction. I journeyed to labs where some of the most cutting edge science um, research is being done on the role of female sexual pleasure. Such labs as that of Dr. Jim Faust at Concordia University in Montreal, where landmark experiments are establishing that female pleasure, female sexual pleasure, plays an important role in mate selection, even among lower mammals. I traveled to Sierra Leone to talk to refugees of sexual violence in the recent conflicts in that country. I began to feel like all of the books and articles and destinations, and even testimonies, only had pieces of the puzzle. And for eventually, when I began to put together some of these pieces of the puzzle, uh, especially the, with the help of the scientists that I interviewed, but also with the help of um, other experts that, that you'll meet in the pages, I realized that the big headline is one that almost no one understands or talks about outside of a tiny, tiny uh, set of subcultures, scientific subcultures, um, which is that there is a profound brain-vagina connection. Uh, and as I began to understand that brain-vagina connection, it began to explain many, many mysteries that had always um, puzzled me about women themselves, but also about why female sexuality in the vagina had always been targeted. So how did I... So I've just said a, a huge thing. Maybe I'll let you take a breath. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell you how I began to take these steps on this journey toward understanding the brain-vagina connection. And again, this is one of those moments where I start to blush, because um, it's personal. But it's, uh, it's the truth about how I began this research. Um, so I had a medical crisis that um, was rather baff quite baffling and disturbing at first. Uh, I began to notice that I was losing uh, physical sensation, specifically pelvic sensation. I was still having orgasms, no problem there, but I began to notice that I was missing some mind states, some states of consciousness after lovemaking that, you know, at its best, I had become, you know, I'd, I'd learned to, you know, associate with those moments. Um, I still had pleasure, but I was noticing unmistakably that that rush of sense of well-being, emotionally, of uh, kind of heightened uh, vibrancy in the world, sense of seeing kind of connections, sociability, happiness about myself, happiness about, you know, everything around me, that wasn't there. It was just pleasure, right? And this was a great loss. I, I felt very frightened that I knew something was wrong, and I knew it was physical. And I was also experiencing some numbness. So thank God I had an incredible group of, of doctors who were some of the foremost specialists in a field I knew nothing about, which turns out to be the field of the female pelvic nerve, um, which is a very important part of your anatomy, which we'll get to. But many, many doctors and scientists, even doctors in the UK, according to emails I'm getting, don't know a thing about it. Um, it's very crucial for female sexuality and female consciousness, and we'll talk about why. 
So uh, I was diagnosed with a spinal injury from years ago that I'd never noticed or never had symptoms from. And uh, I'd been born with a, a mild version of um, spina bifida, so there was a vulnerability. So my spine, this injury, was compressing a nerve that went, was part of my pelvic innervation, an essential part of my, my, my body. Uh, so I had surgery. They put in a plate, realigned the spine, and I recovered. And I, not only did I recover all of my sensation, but the absolutely mind-blowing thing to me, and this is why I'm telling this very personal story, is that there was no way I could ignore the fact that I recovered different, these different states of consciousness as well that were so important to me. So I knew that there was something that happened. And the more I learned uh, interviewing the doctors who treated me and the scientists that they referred me to and then reading this new body of research and interviewing other scientists, the more I understood what had happened. So this is, this is it. This is, this is the, the core of what you need to know about this really important um, piece of information that in spite of a lifetime of following female sexuality and growing up in a very, you know, right on family in town, no one had taught me. The vagina is not just a sex organ. It is misunderstood as merely a sex organ. It is actually a mediator of very powerful and important neurotransmitters to the female brain. Here's what I mean. When a woman knows about how to have her own sexual pleasure, and I'm stressing her own because knowing about your own sexual pleasure comes before, um, you know, sort of being awakened to it by another lover. Uh, when she feels free to fantasize about sex, rewarding sex, um, anticipate it, strategize to get it, right? Which, let us confess, you know, <laughs> we do. I, I say in one of my lines in the book, the vagina is on a quest. <laughs> you know, we all know what that means. Um, <laughs> uh, then dopamine is activated. And, and dopamine has to do with the reward system. But dopamine also, I call it the ultimate feminist neurotransmitter because the mind states that are associated with dopamine are confidence, motivation, goal orientation, a sense of um, trust or reliance in your own perceptions, uh, energy, um, uh, you know, courage, uh, sense of appropriate risk taking, sociability. I mean, you get a huge dopamine boost with cocaine, for example. Uh, so it's that kind of outward looking, self-assertive, um, neurotransmitter. When a woman has an orgasm, which is a much more complex piece of science than any of us were taught in eighth grade, uh, she, she gets uh, opioids. And opioids are about ecstasy, they're about bliss. Um, some women experience this as a sense of transcendence or being swept away, uh, a sense of being connected to something larger than yourself. And this blew my mind because of all those scenes in, in Victorian women's literature and you know, really women's literature as a whole where the heroine has some sort of swept away experience, you know, this attraction and uh, fear of, of the swept away experience. So opioids cause that sense of a loss of boundaries, loss of self. Um, and finally, oxytocin. Uh, when your nipples are stimulated, when you have an orgasm, those contractions, um, you get uh, the, the hormone oxytocin. Um, boosted. And oxytocin, of course, is the trust hormone, the affection hormone, bonding, closeness, intimacy. So, and it also allows you, some research shows, to see uh, connections between things, to pick up cues. For instance, really interesting studies show that oxytocin heightens uh, women's ability to read, actually people's ability to read emotion on faces. So when I understood that bath of you know, that, that brain-vagina loop, which is so pronounced that the scientists who are studying this refer to the brain, the spine, and the vagina as one system in this regard. Like, I would ask these scientists, so do you consider the vagina part of the brain? And they would say, of course. Of course. It's one system, right? Neurologically. Um, when I understood that, all kinds of other political questions fell into place. Uh, and you can imagine what they are. Um, 
you know, obviously, if the vagina is sort of this, this mediator of various superpowers, essentially, in women, uh, obviously, that explains why for 5,000 years, like, I've never understood this, why are people in the West going back to, you know, some of the earliest recorded history, or certainly, you know, post-Sumerian, um, the post-Sumerian period, so upset about women's autonomous desire and sexuality? Why did the vagina become taboo? Why is it, you know, called, you know, by Tertullian and the Church Fathers, the gateway of hell, you know, the abyss? Um, why has it been the target of, uh, you know, female genital mutilation, clitoridectomy, you know, in year after era? The brain-vagina science really explains why. If you want to target a woman's brain, you target her vagina. And of course, I had to check this with various scientists. And indeed, when a woman uh, has a clitoridectomy or has a female genital mutilation, it interrupts that positive uh, cycle. Um, and so it literally affects uh, the experiences she's having. Um, you know, it, it affects her, her mind states. Uh, it's a way to subjugate women if you subjugate the vagina. There were other quite amazing, and I'll go through them quickly, um, sort of very happy headline moments in this journey of uh, learning the new science. Uh, and things that really, as a woman, I, I keep, you know, I would keep finding this, these things out and thinking, how is this not on the front page of, you know, the New York Times? How is this not, you know, a stop the presses moment? Uh, for example, Dr. Barry Komisarek at Rutgers University in New Jersey has found a new sexual center in women. He's identified a, a new sexual center at the mouth of the cervix that behaves you know, in identifiably sexual ways. If men had a new sexual center you know, secreted somewhere about them that you know, everyone didn't know about, I would have thought um, it would be a major news story. Um, uh, Komisarek and Beverly Whipple have a new study which hasn't yet even been published, but it's quite extraordinary, that shows um, that if you stimulate different parts of a woman's uh, vaginal walls or cervix or the G-spot or the clitoris or the labia, it activates different parts of the brain that are associated with different emotions and brain functions. And one lesbian reader who read my book, I mean, all kinds of things you know, um, emerge from that, but many readers of all sexualities, I should say, who, who read about that study are kind of blown away because you know, we, we feel these things, we experience them, but it, it's quite extraordinary to, you know, to see the science of it. Um, it turns out that the autonomic nervous system in women is highly correlated to arousal, um, more so than in men, so that women really do need to feel safe say from what Dr. Jim Faust at Concordia University calls bad stress, in order for that really important autonomic nervous system uh, response that is so crucial for profound female sexual pleasure to take place. In other words, in, if there's bad stress, you, your autonomic nervous system won't as easily let your heart rate lift when someone's making love to you, or you won't start to sweat, you won't start to lubricate as much, you, you know, your vaginal walls won't engorge with blood as much. The you know, clitoris and labia won't engorge with blood as much. It, it's literally a direct uh, effect uh, whether you're emotionally stressed out and if you can get turned on or turned on really well, which is why so many women feel crazy if you know, their partner or husband or girlfriend or you know, lover left socks around or snapped at them or were disrespectful in, some, disrespectful in some way in the last 24 hours, and then when it's time to make love, they can't quite feel it, right? And they think, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just switch that off? You're not crazy. You can't. There's a direct, there's a direct correlation. Um, it, so in, in these ways, the vagina is kind of a, um, a barometer letting a woman know when she's safe, uh, when she's valued, when she's respected, and that lets all of these um, arousal responses open up. Um, you know, I found, I witnessed this incredible, incredible experiment or study uh, by Jim Faust, whom I mentioned at Concordia University, which, and again, front page news, Nobel Prize, he established the role of lower 
mammal, female sexual desire in, in mate selection. You know, this is how he did it. He, his lab assistants take these little adorable virgin rats, right? <laughs> female rats. They're called naive rats. That's a scientific term, apparently. Um, you know, I felt naive watching this. You know, it's like, who knew the rats? And what do they do? They stimulate the clitoris of the rat. Did we know that rats had clitorises? <laughs> you know, I didn't know that. I mean, I'm, I'm well educated, and no one taught me in eighth grade biology that all mammals have clitorises. Show of hands, who was taught that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they, they, inject, they inject one group with naloxone, which blocks uh, these rats' experience of pleasure, and the other group with saline, which doesn't. And then you witness the, the naloxone rats are put into cages, especially designed by a woman scientist, so that the females control the interaction with the males through these cute little doors that they run in and out of. And it makes you think all kinds of things. And, um, <laughs> And then the, the saline rats are in the same situation. And you see this amazing thing happen, and we've got this on video. The naloxone rats will interact with the males a couple of times, but they're not getting that reward. They're not getting pleasure. So they start to look like a character in a Stringberg play. You know, they start to like become less and less mobile, stop trying. You see them stopping trying, and then they start to stare into space and look, you know, very depressed. <laughs> you know? And meanwhile, the male rat is like, honey, please, you know, I, I just want you. I mean, I remember one of them kind of trying to get through the little door, which is too small for him to get through, and he's like, his nose is stuck, and he's like trying to pull her back to his side with his, you know, little paws. But um, <laughs> it's like a bad marriage. And... On the other side, you know, here are the saline rats, and they're skipping into where the males are, and they're, you know, sniffing and letting themselves be sniffed, and then they're jumping on the guys' backs and humping them, which no one told us about either in science class. And, you know, and they're, they're being flirtatious. I didn't know rats could flirt, but apparently this is how they do it. It's called headwise orientation. They look at the male rat, and then they scamper away. You know, does this sound like a bar, right? It's like, <laughs> you know, but they're like so, they're getting reinforcement. They're getting pleasure. And so they're getting more and more excited. But the main thing is they're not, what's clear is that they're not just excited about the sexual reward. They're, they're exploring their environment. They're sniffing around their cages. They're curious. They're socializing. They're interacting. They're exploring their food. They're, you know, they're just into their lives their little rat lives. They're energized. Um, and so there you see like this extraordinary visible effect of arousal and pleasure either, you know, motivating and inspiring a set of rats. Well, maybe aspiring is anthropomorphic, but, you know, energizing one set of rats and depressing another. And then this uh, second extraordinary part of this experiment is he had, he, associated a scent with some of the males, like almond or lemon scent on their fur. And then later, without giving anyone naloxone, the females who had not had, who had bad sexual experiences um, avoided the males who smelled like the guy who gave them the bad sexual experience, you know, fault of his own. And there was, um, there was cognition going on, measurable cognition. They were making decisions about their futures based on their memory of bad sexual experiences. Extraordinary. Um, so, you know, there, there were other quite amazing uh, sort of cu cutting edge scientific um, uh, documentations of the brain vagina connection that uh, I won't mention in detail. You know, one of them that I think is very, very important has to do with. Um, with uh, sexual assault and sexual violence. Um, our our ju judicial system kind of treats violent rape as one where you get beaten up or you know, injured in some way, and other rapes are nonviolent rapes, and, and they're very difficult to prosecute and convict. Well, it turns out the science has established, has established a, a deep body of evidence that there is no such thing as a nonviolent rape, that rape stays in the female brain, it stays in the female body, uh, in measurable ways that are very different from anything we've understood about sexual assault. 
For example, one study by Alessandro Rolini and Cindy Meston show that um, a group of women who self-report rape or sexual abuse, quote unquote, nonviolent in their pasts, their autonomic nervous systems react differently with significant measurable differences to how they respond, you know, in terms of heart rate and excitement and so on, to both exercise and erotic videos, as opposed to the control group. And other, uh, other uh, scientists and doctors like Dr. Burke Richmond um, in uh, Michigan have found uh, clust clusters of symptoms that occur years later that seem completely unrelated to rape and sexual assault, like tinnitus and perceptual difficulties and difficulties with balance. Um, but they're so recognizable that he now asks that history when he sees that cluster of symptoms. For instance, women with quote unquote nonviolent rape or sexual abuse in their pasts have often have something he calls phobic postural sway, which means they, they're literally easier to push over. It's harder for them to stand their ground on, on a not an emotional level, not a psychological level, on the level of the body. So this, I hope that the chapter on the documentation of these lasting effects on the body of, you know, quote unquote, ordinary rape uh, will influence the prosecution of rape and show that there is no such thing as a nonviolent rape and also help the treatment of women because a, um, a lot of these changes in the brain and body really need Talking, the talking cure uh, to be informed also by more physically oriented interventions uh, like those developed by PTSD research at um, Bellevue Hospital. Um, and, and on a happier note, I also found that um, there are incredible differences that most of us are not taught, I certainly wasn't, about the very nature of female, um, female sexuality as opposed to male. So I mentioned that there were huge misconceptions in how our culture kind of portrays um, male and female sexual response since Masters and Johnson were sort of given to understand that they're quite similar. Uh, this is really bad for women, as it turns out, because they're totally different. <laughs> um, uh, and what I mean is this. For example, there are these amazing medical illustrations called Netter images, and if you look uh, at the netter images of male pelvic innervation. You see, I mean, it's all good. I, I like all genders. But <laughs> males are very simple in terms of their nervous system <laughs> in the pelvis and in the penis. It's right there, and then it goes right out there, and it's like a grid of nerves, a neural structure around the penis. So while I'm sure men's fantasies and sexuality and so on is very individual, very diverse, there are some basic things that make most men happy, right, physically. Um, however, look at the female innervation of the female pelvis in the Netter images. It is a whole other world. And what you see is that fe the female pelvis has about eight or nine. I mean, it's so tangled and complicated and, you know, crazy in a good way uh, that it's almost hard to kind of count how many neural termini, sexual termini. Some are around the walls of the vagina. Some come to the clitoris. Those are the best known, the ones that we're most familiar with. Some are in the perineum. Some are in the anus. Um, they are all over the place. And uh, even more complicatedly, um, some of them are routinely cut in childbirth, like with episiotomy in the perineum, and no one tells you that they're cutting a major sexual center when they give you an, a routine episiotomy or an unnecessary episiotomy. Um, and what is even more extraordinary is that no one tells women that every single woman is wired differently. So if one woman likes you know, vaginal penetration and the other really doesn't but really likes to have her clitoris stimulated and you know, other women like anal sex and other women hate anal sex, you know, there's no judgment necessarily about this. It may not be what your, you know, the nuns said to you in third grade. It could just be your beautiful, subjective, you know, individual pelvic wiring. But what it means is, you know, understanding this about women means you can't assume from about woman B that what worked with woman A is going to work. You have to learn your lover's patterns and responses very, very carefully and patiently and really anew, you know, each time, and sometimes a new, depending on what time of the month it is, right? That's how complex uh, women are, um, in a good way. 
Um, and the last thing I want to tell you, because it's a really good takeaway, a little you know, homework or whatever, um, is that there's all this debate, and there has been since Freud and even before Freud, vagina clitoris, right? Big fight in the 70s, big fight. In the 70s, the, the, it was ideological. Feminists said, it's all about the clitoris, and the vagina is kind of you know, tacky, sort of stay-at-home mom, you know, not as fab. And, you know, and, and that women who had vaginal orgasms are male identified and internalized the oppressor and so on. It's amazing the ways that the vagina has been ideologized by, by its supporters and detractors. Um, however, new scientific discovery shows that, and no one told us, in fact, there is, and forgive me, the language is terrible, a lot of the language about the vagina and the female pelvis is quite inadequate. There is what anatomists call a neural arm, forgive me, gross, but there you are, um, in the front of the, sort of behind the pubic bone, and such that the clitoris is here and the G-spot is here, they're north and south of the same neural structure. They're not different things at all. They're the same thing. What does this mean? I mentioned earlier that about 30% of women can't reach orgasm regularly when they want to in, in many kinds of lovemaking. Over 90% of women in lab conditions with strangers uh, reached orgasm when both of these points were stimulated at the same time. So I think that's handy information. <laughs> so <laughs> everything is a double entendre these days. Um, so, so I'm going to skip very briefly over uh, what I was going to tell you about the history of the suppression of the vagina in the West. Turns out that um, most cultures that uh, we that you know that we began recorded history with, if you like, like the Sumerian uh, culture, had a, a fertility goddess or sex goddess in its pantheon, and that the vagina was often considered sacred. In these cultures, the vagina was considered like a gateway between this world and the other world, or it was considered part of the force that kept the universe in balance. Um, Inanna, for instance, the Sumerian goddess, talks about her beautiful sacred vagina in. Um, ancient texts. Um, but with the rise of, and I'm going to zip through 5,000 years of history, with the rise of patriarch patriarchal religions that had to kind of win people away from these goddess cults that had sacred priestesses, sex priestesses, um, they had to demonize female sexuality. And that's where you get this imagery of the harlot, the harlot of Babylon, and this, the beginning of this demonization of female desire. This reached a, a high point or a foundational point for us in the West with the church fathers. Tertullian and other church fathers who were quite extreme fanatical hermits uh, living in North Africa and around the Middle East uh, developed a highly misogynistic language. They were also celibate and sort of probably needed to keep all of those things at bay. Um, uh, casting the vagina as this gateway to hell, this satanic abyss, the cause of, you know, man's perdition, and so on. And that became a template for, you know, obviously for the Christian West. Um, nonetheless, there, was, there were a lot of periods even in the West where there was like affection for the vagina. And in fact, women were considered to have to uh, climax in order for conception to occur. Um, and the, if you look back at some of the, and I'm skipping, you know, 1,500 years, but I sort of have to. Oh, in that 1,500 years, the clitoris got found by Reynaldus de Columbus, um, believe it or not, um, in the 16th century, lost, found, lost, found, lost about seven times by anatomists, right? Didn't go anywhere on women's bodies. It was still there, but it's, it's you know, what's this? Look at this. Uh, until it was finally sort of found again. Um, and you know, located permanently, you know, in, in the 1920s in uh, sexual information literature, um, but uh, but yeah, that that was um, an example of how threatening it is to just keep a record, <laughs> you know, where things are. Um, <laughs> but the the unique uh, anxiety that we have today, you know, even in the sexual revolution, quote unquote, that somehow you know, our vaginas make us kind of icky, or it's kind of medicalized, the language around the vagina, or it's kind of porny, or there's, uh, 
you know, a sense of there being something not respectable, not nice about the vagina. That is quite a recent social construct historically. Um, and, and it's got important uh, dimensions for us. Um, and it, it, it really got solidified in the 19th century. So what happened in the early 19th century? Uh, women began, middle class women began to be educated. There began to be um, universal education in Britain and the United States uh, for, well, certainly for middle class girls. And uh, women began to lobby for their rights, their legal and political rights. So that, you know, before that happened, no one cared that much, for instance, about female masturbation. Uh, if you read uh, John Cleland's 1748 Fanny Hill, for instance, the vagina is described in all kinds of very loving ways. Female masturbation is described. Female orgasm is described. N no one's upset about it. Um, but the Victorian ideologues of gender rejected the body and sometimes adoring more integrated middle ground uh, that the previous century had taken for granted. And the new discipline of gynecology and obstetrics that was sort of fighting against midwifery for business as well as for social control recast female masturbation which had that, had at that point been scarcely noticed uh, as an obsessed over sinkhole of shame and degradation, and also recast female sexual pleasure and intercourse, which to that point had been taken for granted, uh, if sometimes invaded against, as a chimera, a blazing stigma, or a degrading grotesquerie. And I think this is an unconscious reaction to the dopamine connection. All these empowered women were about to get out of control, you know, <laughs> put them back uh, in their places uh, through ignorance and shame. Um, so, you know, there was so much change. Women secured the Married Women's Property Act of 1857. Uh, they were forced then into brutal pelvic exams, which people really don't know about in the Contagious Diseases Acts of 1864. Women who looked like they were sexual or looked like they might be prostitutes, which was a very vague, you know, job category at that time, were literally kidnapped off the streets in Britain in the thousands and uh, held in lock hospitals and forcibly vaginally examined by strangers and kept up to nine months against their will to keep STDs ostensibly out of um, the armed forces. Uh, but I think this was a great trauma in Western women's consciousness, in our, it's in our collective memory. Um, they fought for the Married Women's Property Act of 1870 and 1882 by the end of the century, establishing women's colleges at Oxford and Cambridge, um, and fighting to get into the professions. And so given the dopamine vagina brain nexus, it is reasonable that an ideology would arise, even if subconsciously, that it would increasingly rigorously keep these same newly educated middle class Western women um, fr from further disruptiveness and that would indeed punish them in many ways for even considering touching their vaginas and clitorises. Um, in the pre-Victorian world, even elite women were generally uneducated and propertyless. It didn't matter to anyone if they masturbated or had sexual pleasure. Um, and the 19th century obsession with the dangers of female desire uh, has to be understood as uh, being a backlash against female emancipation from the home. In fact, gynecologist William, a William Acton, a very influential um, sex guide author whose work went into many editions, uh, said in his 1875 treatise, Functions and Disorders of Reproductive Organs, that, quote, masturbation may best be described as a habitual incont incontinence eminently productive of disease, and noticed, though, that, quote, the majority of women, happily for society, are not very much troubled with sexual feeling of any kind. He also believed that, quote, as a general rule, a modest woman seldom desires any sensual gratification for herself. She submits to her husband's embraces, but principally to gratify him. The married woman has no desire to be placed on the footing of a mistress, this duality. Um, so given that ideology, the trauma of the Contagious Diseases Acts, where the state wouldn't protect you if you had had sexual experience, in fact, it would imprison you, potentially, um, we inherit that template. Many women today feel that their sexuality is something distinct from the rest of their character, uh, cut off from their more admirable roles as mothers, wives, or workers, um, or may feel inhibited in bed by the sense that their sexual pleasure in some way demeans them. This worldview is not a human constant. It's not even very old. Um, it was essentially invented when cultural critics in Europe and America were alarmed by female enfranchisement 160 years ago, and we are not stuck with this dualism. Now I will wrap up and take your questions. Um, I'm going to zip ahead. 
let's skip forward from 1920 to 1965. Uh, the pill is invented, and we have this, what's called the sexual revolution, and you know the sort of liberation of women from reproductive control. Um, you know, as I said, that is not. It's not working well enough for women. You know, the, the porn is everywhere. Sexual discourse is everywhere. And yet women do not um, feel uh, integrated with their bodies very often. They don't, often don't feel good about their bodies and their sexuality. And, you know, as I mentioned, 30% of them are not feeling reliably sexual at all. Um, so what's, what's wrong? I think you've seen from you know, the, the examples I've shared that many things are wrong and many things can, can be made right. I mean, we've seen that uh, the male and female similarity construct is not true. Um, we've seen that all kinds of trauma, including verbal abuse. I've got a chapter on how language affects the vagina, insulting, threatening language. Um, continually degrade women's ability to relax and reach arousal. We've seen that we don't even understand our own very basic anatomies, right? We've seen that the porn script, which well, we haven't seen it because we haven't talked about it, but I've got a chapter on porn. Um, the, the porn script is making the sort of expectations of the sex act in our culture faster and faster. And in fact, there's a tantric master whom I uh, learned a lot from in the audience today, um, who, who, and other tantric masters I, I, I interviewed, who pointed out that, um, that you know, the tantric frame around female desire or sexuality is so much longer chronologically than the porn frame. And you know, I went to a retreat uh, to report on it, just research, um, <laughs> in which women were being paired with strangers, and they were quite happy about this, uh, to go off to hotel rooms. And the men were being taught, OK, you're going to run a bath for her. You're going to make the room beautiful. You're going to bring flowers. You're going to turn down the lights. And then you're going to give her sacred spot massage, which is this thing, basically. I'm sure there's more to it than that. You know, <laughs> for, for an hour and a half, right? And you know, you say this to to most men in our culture, or women, really. It's like, I have kids, you know? I, <laughs> where is the time going to come from? But the, the tantric practitioners that I looked at, of all the people who were getting good outcomes, they were getting reliably good outcomes for women with orgasm problems, with trauma, just not feeling good about themselves, with difficulty reaching orgasm. And, and these women the next morning were so happy, right? <laughs> right? And, and the men were also advised, this is all about her. You know, this is not about you, this is just about her. And so the amazing thing that tantras say is that one should pace everything that happens sexually around the woman, or sort of orient everything that happens around the woman's pleasure, right? At first, and, and Mike Luzada, when I inter interviewed him for the first time in the Sunday Times, said the man should hold the woman like a wine glass holds wine, hold her energy. That seemed crazy to me at the time, you know, coming from a Western culture in which it's, it's like, you know, hyperathletic thing, and he's gonna come, and I've got, you know, it's like, right? And it's like, pace it around the woman, okay? Hold her like a wine glass. But in fact, now that I know about the neuroscience that backs up a lot of these tantric practices, and I don't mean scary, complicated tantra, it's like baby tantra 101. It's like it's things like, you know, make the room beautiful um, because women's vaginas in one study, the micro-voltage of their orgasm, there is something called a vaginal pulsometer that these scientists use to measure the strength of female orgasm. If you dim the lights and make the room pretty, you will get four times the micro-voltage <laughs> in the same woman, you know, and pick up the socks, right, because that <laughs> triples the micro-voltage, right? I mean, other little changes you can learn from basic tantra confirmed by, um, by neuroscience, like women need to be gazed at. They need to be looked into the eyes periodically in order to feel connected. And men don't. In the same way, you see men standing side by side. They're very happy talking side by side, not looking at each other. It's threatening, <laughs> right, to, for men to gaze directly in each other's eyes. But mirror neurons explain this deep hunger um, that women have for the gaze. And so the men who have read my book you know, are saying things like, you know what, every evening I put down the Blackberry, and instead of going, uh-huh, 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 
I look at her and I listen to her and I look at her while I'm listening to her and that's made such a difference in how much she wants me and in the peace of our relationship. Um, little things, not so little. Women's bodies respond differently to stroking. So uh, men's bodies, it's fine, they like it. It doesn't lower their heart rate and boost oxytocin levels. But if you stroke a woman, if she's open to it, if you stroke a woman for 10 minutes, right? It's like if you don't know her, it's on the subway, you don't know. <laughs> um, stroke her for 10 minutes, her, she'll produce 10% more oxytocin. She'll like you 10% more. She'll think you're 10% cuter, you know? And, uh, and, and her heart rate will relax. She'll feel more peaceful. You're protecting her heart, her protecting, her, protecting her cardiovascular health, and you're protecting your relationship. And many women have said that their partners do that now after reading my book, and they're able to get through difficult conversations you know, with the stroking then. <laughs> they would have gone off the rails from before. Um, you know, I mean, there, there are so many other details in that chapter that I'll leave you to, to, to read about in the book, but that the bottom line is when we understand each other's different needs, Neither is better. Complementary needs, you know, neither is better. And, you know, gay, straight, bisexual, whatever the relationship, all of us, you know, we're wired to love. We're wired to connect. We're wired to be, to have pleasure. Um, it enhances our creativity, our confidence, our, we, we become better, better wives, better mothers, also better leaders, better stateswomen, better activists, um, you know, more complete human beings when our sexuality, and our brains are integrated as they're meant to be. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Thank you so much. Some people who've read or reviewed the book have um, criticised it for being reductive. D have you had any kind of personal reactions to that kind of reading of the book? Reductive in what way? Um, the way that you state the brain-vagina connection, I think, for some feminists has been a step back. I see. Or a kind of... Um, yeah. Uh, under, undermining in some way. Right. So thank you. It's, it's a very important question, and I'm glad that it, that it came up first, because it's, it's crucial. So the speaker, I'm sorry, what's your name? Ellie. Ellie? She's absolutely right. Um, that uh, the question has come up from critics, not from readers, interestingly, because um, I don't know why. But um, the question has come up, is this is looking at women's biology in this way and looking at how the female brain is influenced by the female vagina. I think you mean essentialism, right? Reducing women to just the physical. And I would be, I would be, very, I'd be very interested to hear what you all think after you've read the book because no one that I've spoken to who has read the book um, has, has come away with that impression at all. Um, first of all, I think that my 23 years of advocating for women's rights and to be taken seriously as professionals and as workers and as leaders um, gives me space from which to investigate um, this latest neuroscience. Second of all, um, it's only in an environment in which women don't have space to explore crucial questions about their own bodies and minds without having a vicious misogynist press use that against women, as the British press so often does, um, will, will women feel like, oh my god, if we even open the door to looking at how our brains might be influenced by our vaginas and vice versa, you know, this will be used against us or used to demean us. Um, in fact, and, and it's interesting to me that, uh, and there's another reason this comes up, which is um, a sort of feminist theory fashion. And for the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a very dominant trend in feminist theory to situate all gender in as a construct, a social construct, right? It's all socially constructed. All gender is socially constructed, sort of the Judith Butler school. So that's very valuable because, you know, in the Victorian period, you're exactly right that women were told you're just your uterus or your uterus will keep you out of Girton, right? Because your uterus rules your brain. Um, but that was people trying to subjugate women. So I think that feminist theory kind of escaped that by situating 
all gender in the brain, in the, as an abstraction, as culturally constructed. But, you know, I'm not making this up. There are 420 pages with, you know, pages and pages of footnotes and abstracts showing this in, in, increasingly vast body of neuroscience. And feminism is just not going to be, it's, it's hiding its head in the sand to not deal with some of this new science that's coming up. Um, so I think that the mission remains the same. You deal with the neuro, new neuroscience, you think about what it might mean, you look at the implications, and you push back against a culture that seeks to use these new findings against women. Um, and the mission remains the same, which is a world that's just and fair in which we can see what some of these differences are um, in men and women. I mean, men are animals too, and there's more and more and you know, brains, and they interact with each other. And there's more and more documentation of uh, you know, how the male body is influenced by emerging neuroscience and the male brain. And nobody is saying, oh, well, this will, you know, this will be used to subjugate men because it's not used politically against men in the same way. A very interesting example of why I think we need to push back against this. I think it's a, I think it's a capitulation to be afraid to investigate this information. It's a capitulation to people who try to use our bodies to demean us and our sexuality to demean us. And my model is the gay rights movement because the exact same thing happened. They were told, your sexuality is demeaning, you know, d don't talk about it, don't confront it, um, you know, and they were, they were marginalized through their sexuality, and finally they said, we're not gonna run from this anymore. We're gonna reclaim the word queer, for example. We're gonna fight back, and we're gonna, you know, insist on a world in which our differences, even if they're, it's interesting, gay readers, gay male readers, gay female readers are not worried about this. You know, about find, you know, there's, there are studies in here that show differences in the gay male brain in reaction to male sexual sweat. Their view is, you know, it, we should not be afraid of looking at the differences that, that science may be developing, uh, establishing. What we need to do is create a just and fair world in which all of our differences are accepted and all of our equality is protected. So that is what I would say to that. And you know, it's not going to go away. I mean, there's just going to be more and more and more neuroscience uh, challenging um, our received wisdom about what it means to have a brain and a body. There's more and more documentation of the brain-body connection. And if feminists say we can't even look at that, they just don't look intellectually rigorous in my view. Thank you. Hi, Naomi, that was really rich. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. You've spoken about women needing to feel safe to experience a arousal properly. And I was wondering if you came across yes. instances where women were in dangerous situations or were bad stressed, as you put it. And, you know, there's documented evidence that some women do find that very arousing. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Right. So I want to make, are you asking the s &M question, which everybody brings up at some point? Um, like, um, is this the rape fantasy not, question? Not, or is this, not, not right. personally, no. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> more of examples where, uh, you know, couples sort of make up sex, where you can be very stressed out right. by that, and that can right. be very arousing. I'm really glad that you clarified that, because in, in my research, there's, there's no evidence that an actual rape or an actual violent situation uh, is arousing to women. I, I mean, where they're out of control. This is what I want to stress. Jim Faust, who's my neuroscience guru in Canada, whom I keep, whom I keep referring to, um, he continually, continually drills down on the fact that a woman has to feel in control of the stress that she's experiencing and not out of control. And actually, the, even the dopamine boost depends on her feeling in control of that reward. So this is why rape is not arousing, but many women have rape fantasies, right? Um, because they're completely in control of what's happening. I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey is flying off the shelves. Now, I want to say something else about... about fantasies of submission, which it, it's a feminist secret. You know, it's very hard to address the fact that many, 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 many women get turned on by kind of dominant submission scenes in which they are being overwhelmed, right? True? Right. Doesn't mean we want you to oppress us, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? Are we clear about that? Here's a fascinating thing Jim Faust also explained. He says that the brain experiences a, like a play-acting scenario, right, where a woman has chosen her partner, she's chosen to be in that situation, she's chosen the fantasy, right? She's safe, 
right? It's, it's all under her control. Um, but there's, quote, say he, he, there's, I don't know, spanking or hair, you know, hair pulling or some other dominance thing. Her brain can experience that. And I'm not advocating anything. Let me be clear. I'm just describing. Her brain can experience that as, quote, unquote, good stress. Um, and of course, men have versions of this, too. And what that can mean is that some people have a lower autonomic nervous system baseline. So that it takes just a little bit more to activate them and get them over the edge to orgasm. And so uh, it means that that spanking or whatever it is might be just that amount of arousal that such a, per I mean, I don't mean uh, sexual arousal, I mean autonomic nervous system activation, that kind of arousal, arousal of heart rate, of, you know, sort of autonomic nervous system excitation that then, you know, sends you kind of into a more heightened orgasmic state or even allows you to reach orgasm. So to me, this is a big takeaway because it means a lot of women are troubled by liking that sort of thing, especially if they're feminists. And it's quite liberating to know that you don't have to be a masochist to be turned on by stuff like that, even if it's just once in a while. It could just be you know, your baseline autonomic nervous system. I mean, you might be a masochist psychologically, but you might not. You might be not a masochist and just like it, right? For physical reasons. So I thought that was good to know. Have I answered your question? You have, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Yes, please. You, you talked about the simplicity of the male organ in its relationship to the brain, or the possible simplicity, and the complexity of, of the, the woman's system, and then how the, the woman's needing to secure safety uh, is different from the man maybe needing to secure curiosity. I don't know, I'll just put that as a... As a, as a and so it, my question really is about the notion of monogamy and the permission for, and the permission for promiscuity. Mm -hmm. um, as men and women talk about what difference is and they get more sophisticated about being happy with difference, which is not the same as inequality, well, I noticed men making the argument for promiscuity. Right. Oh, on yes. The grounds that, Press um, my buttons here. You are right. Well, <laughs> right. Well, yeah. on, on the grounds that the sexual organ needs it, and, it and it's... It's lightweight, and it's lightweight yeah, yeah. And, and has no consequence. I, I get Whereas it, Whereas the woman... Uh. Yeah. So I would just like your response yeah. to yes, that. Yes, I would like to respond to that. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is, this is a, a big, big, infuriating, fake, nonsensical, bogus bastardization of bad neuroscience, okay? And it's everywhere. Men are all... I mean, God bless them. Some men, not all men. I have heard that discourse, especially. I want to say I love Britain, but a lot of these canards show up most in the British press. You know, there's a lot of this. You know, yeah, it's all the selfish gene, Richard Dawkins, the idea that, you know, the male, you know, Darwin says men have to fuck everybody, you know, to get their DNA to just replicate. If you read other uh, evolutionary biolog biologists like Sarah Hurdy and um, the woman who wrote The Anatomy of Love, uh, whose name escapes me, thank you, Helen Fisher, um, you actually will find that, uh, <laughs> from their perspective, natural selection is favored by um, sperm competition, which you get by being a woman having sex with a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, another fascinating thing that I didn't mention to you is that, um, and she actually thinks adultery, um, mutual adultery, uh, how can I put it, that men and women both equally benefit from monogamy and from adultery in evolutionary terms. Um, but what I really want to tell you is that um, there's this fascinating study that shows that women desire, and this is evolutionary, sort of high-risk-taking, dangerous alpha male types when they're ovulating, right, because they want that, you know, high-status sperm. Pardon me. It's like <laughs> <laughs> right? But then when they're not ovulating, they desire safe, loving, nurturing, husbandy, nice guys, right? And so you look at women's fiction, you see this constant duality of like, you know, nice Darcy or mean Darcy, you know, right? The, 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 the Rhett Butler or that nice guy whose name no one remembers, you know, right? <laughs> and it's that, I believe, it's that ovulatory tragedy. And so I have this section in the book aimed at men called Don't Be Scary But Don't Be Boring. Which is about how one man can be both, you know, be really exciting and engaging and entertaining, keep her aroused, keep her, you know, don't take her for granted, and also don't scare her, don't snap at her, don't degrade her, don't insult her, um, which 
so I want to say one final thing about Jim Faust. So basically, it's nonsense. Or if it's the truth that there is in any evolutionary advantage for um, promiscuity is even more documentation that women benefit from it with multiple partners than that men do. I want to say one more thing. Jim Faust has found that while um, that can be a factor, another factor can be the oxytocin bond, which makes male lower mammals, as well as female, return to their familiar partner because he's identified an actual kind of emotional template or love template, you know, that, that uh, positive feelings, positive associations like oxytocin bonding, which is why cuddling and holding is so important in a long-term relationship, make that male lower mammal return, you know, be, choose the mate, choose the familiar mate, even while there are all kinds of cute other new rats wandering around. <laughs> So um, it, it's not okay. And the last thing I would say, and this goes to your point, we're not just animals, right? We all might have these temptations. I might like a lot of sperm competition theoretically, you know, but I'm a grown-up, right? And so if you make a commitment to a partner, that's your prefrontal cortex making a commitment to a partner. You're not, you know, you, your penis and vagina influence your thoughts, but they're not, de you know, they don't determine the outcomes, right? Round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you so much, Tommy. It's fascinating. You mentioned a lot the neuroscience, but there's also a lot of mentions of different hormones that goes into the science. So what's the linkage there, and how does that change over time as women age? Oh, that's a very good, excellent question. Uh, so you're asking the menopause question, I think, or the, yeah. Um, so, so actually it changes... It changes over a woman's life cycle, I'm hearing, in ways we're not even familiar with. Like, women in their 20s seem to be more clitorally activated um, than knowing, you know, more about other bits. And then women in their 30s often figure out how to have what's called blended orgasms. When you have a baby, your vagina actually gets more um, responsive because of the vaginal wall folds creating more um, contact, you know, and sensation. Um, if you haven't had a traumatic birth. And then menopause is the big question because of course the hormones change and certain hormone levels fall. So um, there's a lot of different opinions about this, uh, but many of the physicians I interviewed said that when women, and I'm not advocating, that when women um, take bioidentical estrogens, uh, which are not as toxic and dangerous, I gather, as the pharmaceutical kind, that can keep these things percolating along. Um, and for women who don't choose to do that, um, I, there's a dearth of science, but I'm hearing from, from people who, gerontologists and people who work with um, older women populations and older women who are telling me all sorts of information, women in their 60s and 70s, that uh, sexual desire continues. Um, and, but what they say is use it or lose it. And the neuroscience backs that up. Uh, and that also that you need a partner who is not giving up basically. Um, or as one 65-year-old woman said, I'm having really hot sex, um, use it or lose it, and a younger lover, but um, I'm not, you know, but, you know, see, see the neuroscience thing can go both ways. But, um, uh, but yeah, for sure, you know, other women say that there's a diminution in that driven sense that they kind of love. So what, I, what I'd like to conclude is that I think our vaginas have wisdom for us at each stage of our lives and that these changes are a natural um, part of our sexuality. You know, whether it's more heightened or more muted, it's, it's all good. Yes? A lot of your work um, has a lot of research based on medical research and, um, and, uh, and tantra, I suppose, as well. Um, but I, I'd like to know... Um, I mean, the whole medical research is a lot of, um, for a, you, you empower women through your research, through your research, through uh, medical research, as well as, I suppose, experiential research. And you also say that but there's something not working. And, you know, this medical research and experiential research um, make them very um, powerful. But... I, I feel that maybe an element is missing. Powerful doesn't mean that they are happy. So what is, what is the missing link to help 
helping women be powerful and, and comfortable with their sexuality and yet being happy with it. Right. And how yes, do you, thank you, what do you bring yeah. in to, right. um, through your empowerment of women right. at that level? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question. What's your name? Gurmit. Thank you. Thank you. Because if I, if I left you that impression that it's just about power, I misspoke. Um, it, it is about happiness, uh, you know, measurably. I mean, there are these crazy studies that show from Central Europe that show that women who know how to have orgasms more or less when their partners are having orgasms show higher levels of satisfaction in all areas of their lives, including mental health, satisfaction with work, satisfaction with family relationships. And it kind of makes sense because you're not you know, really cranky all the time, right? Um, so I, I am talking about happiness. I mean, let's just talk about oxytocin. You know, oxytocin is about love. It's about bonding. Um, it's about connection. And it's, it's not just about power, right? I mean, oxytocin what, is what makes you fall in love with your baby. But, you know, I kind of want to ref get, get a, a, an expert opinion also from someone who's in the room who has had quite extraordinary outcomes working as a sexual healer with women who are <laughs> pre-orgasmic or not orgasmic or who've had sexual trauma and then... Um, and I've interviewed some of his, his patients, they then report not just, uh, many of them, not just uh, you know, much easier orgasm, happier relationship to their own sexuality, but they report to my astonishment at first uh, many other changes in their lives. Like this one client of Mike's said, you know, not only did these physical changes happen, but I moved out of my parents' house, I quit my job as a secretary, I stopped going out with abusive men, I got a job as a journalist, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I loved myself, I, I started to love myself. So I, I'd like to refer, you know, to, to Mike, you know, if you could briefly tell us what, what you see about that. Why would the work you do with women, he's advising the, the various medical entities here in Britain now who are trying to learn about this, why would women whom you've treated who have better sexual outcomes also report more happiness? What's that link in your experience? Well, I think you speak a lot to it in the neurological studies that you talk about in the book. Um, and first of all, I'd say that orgasm is probably the biggest legal drugs hit that you can actually deliver to yourself. Um, there's so many neurochemicals and neurotransmitters being delivered through that experience that it's absolutely transformative and it has a, um, a cumulative effect on the body and on the brain. And uh, I think what I see in my clients is that when they start to experience giving themselves permission to be in touch with their sexuality, they give themselves permission to live life more fully. And I think that our sexual energy is our life force energy. We're all here at the end of the day as a result of sex. And so that life force, if, it's, if our sexuality is suppressed, then our whole sense of what it means to be alive is suppressed. Let me, can I just add to that? Thank you so much, Mike. And, and uh, you know, I think it's very, very interesting that, you know, some of these neuroscientists are like wiring electrodes to Mike's brain, right, to find out, you know, what's he doing? Um, and also that he's presenting to medical bodies like... Uh, well, I have presented my work to the NHS, and I also work with, with um, doctors and psychotherapists. Right, who are, right, who, who are dealing with clients with sexual dysfunction issues, right, sexual abuse issues. So what I want to add, which is interesting to this and why the gay rights movement is such a model for me, is that one lesbian who read my book said that after you come out of the closet, the sex is hotter, and that's... That's about, to me, that's about that integration. And I have to say, growing up in San Francisco, I saw it. You know, I saw a population of people who had been silenced and asked to repress their sexual identity, closeted, and then they came out, and they came out politically, and they came out to their parents, and they came out sexually, and it was just, it was another group of people. You know, they were, they were living fully, you know, and that goes to happiness, yeah. Yes, please. What you're describing sounds kind of quite terrifying and sort of like, and complex I mean do you feel understanding the science makes you feel more optimistic about people's do you mean it relationships between men and women or yeah. women and women or anyone or both or right generally? much more optimistic and, and it's not just my opinion I'm hearing from readers who are much more optimistic but is that the knowledge is power argument as in for people who don't I mean it's practical book? it's practical like one young woman uh, in my talk at Bristol yesterday we were talking earlier about how so many young women in sexually coercive situations don't feel able to say, 
I don't like this, or stop, or I want to do this but not that. And she said, where does that come from? And we talked about how the whole culture you know, suppresses your, your sexual voice your whole life. Uh, even in a write-on porny culture, you're not encouraged. They don't teach you about the clitoris in eighth grade, you know? They don't, I mean, you're very lucky if you got the clitoris in your, you know. <laughs> but they, they don't encourage you to, to articulate what you want, right? Or know about it. And so her question in the Q&A was, how do I learn to have blended orgasms, right? How do, I, how do I learn that? I'm having clitoral orgasms now. How do I learn that? And then some other woman there, you know, gave her lots of information and, you know, I gave her some information. And, and, but what I said was, you know, I asked the audience to give her a round of applause. And I said, this is a really historic moment because this earlier question is connected to this question, right? She, she was actually, and again, with that dopamine loop, she was taking responsibility for learning about her own pleasure. She was getting factual advice. She was getting a takeaway. And, but more importantly to me as a teacher, she was making space in the world to allow her voice to ask the questions that she needed to ask. For her own self, and that's that's sexy. That's gonna it makes her smarter. It makes her more of an owner of her body. I'm sure it's gonna make her safer if she's ever in a coercive situation or a violent situation, and it's gonna make her more responsive. And and uh, it's gonna benefit all the people around her. So, it, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. And I think you'll see. Like I went into the science partly in this detail because we're here in this venue, but it's a very user friendly book. It's, it's got very, you know, easy, <laughs> easy outcomes, easy changes. Yeah. yeah. Can I go ahead and I just want to make sure I'm not missing anyone that I don't see who's desperately, urgently wanting to ask. Um, so you're pointing to, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. To, of course. Scott. Hi. Scott gets the mic. Hi, thanks very much, Naomi. Um, I was just wondering what you think the key thing is that's needed um, to kind of change female mentality about how to embrace their own sexuality. Like, is it the knowledge of what you've been explaining, or is it something else? Oh, wow. It's, that's such a good question. Um, it's so many things. You know, certainly it starts with the knowledge. I mean, without the knowledge, what are we? You know, uh, but it, 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 again, the gay rights movement is such a good model. They needed basic knowledge, but they need it. you need to reclaim your history, right? So that's why I gave a history of female sexuality. You need to tell your own stories, you know, like that young woman was doing, it, articulate your own needs. I think as more and more women kind of come forward and talk, like we're talking in this very kind of sacred patriarchal space, you know, about the vagina. That's, you know, you, that's a, a historical kind of institutionalization of the okayness of this discussion, right? We need to change rape law so that women are no longer ashamed when they're raped. It's the rapist's shame. And that because there's space in the culture for female yes, it, it doesn't invalidate the female no, right? And so, you know, most rapes right now don't get convictions because most rapes take place when there's a, a meeting between a young man, usually and a young woman, that starts consensual and then becomes non-consensual. So the police don't prosecute, judges don't convict, because there was some yes, right? That's that Victorian thing. But if we all claim the right to a yes and the right to a no, that's, that will eventually transform rape law. And there has to be room for female sexual desire in the law, right? Just because I wanted this doesn't mean I wanted that. Um, I think that knowing the science of rape trauma will also support women. Um, a lot of women just suffer a lot because of these after effects that they're not aware of. Um, I think, you know, men, you know, in heterosexual relationships, men are really, like, one reviewer said, and I really appreciated this, that what I'm calling for is a revolutionary transformation uh, of the way men treat women. And it's true. Um, I think men are not taught, heterosexual men are not taught well. A lot of straight men that I interviewed told me this. They're not taught well about fe women. They're not taught well at all about female desire and arousal and orgasm. You can watch porn all day long and not know anything, actually know some really stupid things about, you know, you know here's my teammate, so great, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so I think the more men know who are heterosexual or in relationships with a woman, the better that will be. And I, yeah, and I, I just also think that again with the gay rights movement being the model, you know, it goes to your question, when women stop running, 
when they stop running and they say, you know what, fuck you. I have a vagina, I have a brain, I have a sexuality, I'm a serious person, I'm not gonna run from it anymore. What I saw in the gay rights movement is that you know, very quickly that becomes transformative. If enough, enough people do it all at once and if, if our lovers stand by us, you know, whatever gender. Yeah, yes please. And the vagina being so key to kind of female positivity and femininity, femininity what does that, what effect does that have on women who aren't having sex? So, so glad you asked that. You're all asking all the, all the crucial questions. Thank you. Because uh, I didn't bring this up and I should have. Let me stress the, it, the neurology of the dopamine vagina loop is that your, relate, not you personally, but you know, ones, our relationship to our own sexuality comes first. So absolutely that, um, you know, becoming, having a sexual relationship with yourself these are very euphemistic ways to say it is a really good idea to masturbate. You know, if you're in, not in a relationship, uh, or if you're in a, you know, depending on what's going on, you know, long trips, whatever. Um, you know, uh, it, it's it's really critical for women to understand, support, respect, attend to their own sexuality, and the neuroscience also says sensuality, like all those things women do are not really honored in our culture, the wanting softness or taking hot baths or scented things or pretty things or candles. You know, these are all really, really crucial um, ways that we need to attend to what a tantrist would call the goddess and what I would call, you know, our basic neuro neurobiological needs to be caressed, to, you know, be in touch with our sensuality, you know, whether, whether we have someone else there or not. Um, and then... You know, and then if there's a lover, that's great. Uh, but that sexual relationship, that sexuality continues whether there's a lover or not. Yeah. And, and who tells this? Can I just say, in Britain, when they give you the pill, the contraceptive pill, do they warn you that it will suppress your libido? In big black letters? When they give you antidepressants, do they warn you that it suppresses female libido? In big black letters. Yes, they do. All right. Better than nothing. Um, but yeah, we should take care of our libido. Yes, please. I just want to say a really big thank you. Say it in the mic. <laughs> um, no, repeat that in the mic. <laughs> she said thank well, you. Well, it's really important. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not being arrogant. I'm not actually surprised by any of the things you said because I've studied lion sexuality for 11 lion years. Lion sexuality? Yeah. Tell and, me about lion well, sexuality. It's, it, it just blew my mind, and um, in Do, terms so, of yes. well, in, ter in terms of the the, um, the neurology. So I think we shouldn't be surprised that our vaginas are linked to our brains in the same way we shouldn't be surprised our toes are linked to our brains. Um, but I think that what you're doing is so beautiful, and I think that the um, the sensuality and the poetry of male and female relationships are not destroyed by understanding the science in the same way that unweaving the rainbow um, did not destroy the beauty of a rainbow. That is so um, beautifully put. So, Thank you so much. Um, I, I really celebrate what you're saying. And my kids were brought up watching lions having sex. So, <laughs> um, um, it's kind of why I knew that mammals had you know, clitoris. clitoris? Uh, yeah. Do lionesses um, have really... Oh, yeah, sure. A lion like... sexuality, I, I, you know, it's, it's a big deal. But Ow. the thing is, <laughs> is, is talking about it. And um, I think that men's penises are every bit as important as our vaginas. And they have... Um, and not um, well understood, your would and, say. Mm -hmm. You know, their oxytocin is very functional right. and it aids peristalsis, but right. it also makes them feel good and right. it triggers dopamine. Yes. And, and I think that male orgasm coming is not necessarily a good orgasm. I mean, right. you can have... Right. Right. Do you see what I mean? So I what I try and do with my kids, boys and girls, is to talk about... So great. So can I ask Sorry, you quickly to, from, you. from the perspective of a scientist who studies animal sexuality, what would you say to this question that this uh, audience member asked about, does knowing about the science of our sexuality and its effect on our brain diminish us or expand us from your perspective, just briefly? I would say very much that it expands us. Um, and I think that... Um, 
it, it helped me at a personal level. There were various things that I was puzzled about. Um, and, yeah, I think the science, is like, as, I, as I said, it is unweaving the rainbow. And, and I think it is so exciting. And when you were talking about smell, oh, my gosh, the link between smell and memory is absolutely incredible. Right. It is a direct um, do not pass go um, uh, 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 neuron that goes from our, from our nose to our memory wow. centers. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's the only part of this, these neurons, that, that, that when, mostly when neurons die, they don't replenish, but with these ones, they do, oh, wow. and they follow the same pathway. So we may not have, we, when we remember something, we remember the feeling of something, and, and watching lions, they're smelling the wow. partners that they wow. liked, and I'll stop. So, so lions, <laughs> wow, oh, just, that's a book. I'm, Lenny, that's a book, that is awesome. Awesome. Love it. In, thank you. In the Q&A, will you tell me more about what those lionesses are up to? <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, not the Q&A, the book signing. Yes, please. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my question is that I think there's a... To me, I wasn't surprised that there's this link between the vagina and the brain. And I think one of the things that we most women experience is when we get our periods, we have a very strong uterus-vagina link to our brains. We're cranky, we're unhappy, we're insecure. Chocolate. Eat chocolate, <laughs> a lot of chocolate, a lot of baths, a lot of scented candles, and it's a moment when we need extra gentle, sensual care from ourselves and our lovers and everyone around us. Right. Now, I wonder, since six out of 10 people born are women, and they all have their period, and they all get really unhappy and un like sad and cranky once a month, why is that not more part of the culture to be understanding oh. instead of being all like, oh, you got your period. Right. Oh, that is you such know, a good a question. Yeah. I, mean, I get it. It's fair I, yeah. to ask ourselves and everyone around us to say, let's be kinder to ourselves yeah. during this time because it's, it's fair that it's we such, feel this way. such a beautiful, important question because it's part of a larger thing. Like, why is... You know, why are vaginas treated so insultingly in childbirth? In, certainly in the United States, I wrote a book about this. Why is rape treated so dismissively? Why, like I would say the reason that this really important and hormonally, uh, <laughs> you know, upheavalish cyclical nature of our being not respected, and it's not respected because it has to do with those nasty pussies. You know, it has to do with, right? Because our vaginas are not respected, our uteruses are not respected, our reproductive capacity is not respected, our hormonal changes are not respected. Interestingly, there are cultures in which women don't have a lot of power, in which there is more kind of um, like gentleness around that menstrual change, but not a lot. And I think it's all part of the same thing, and I think we should you know, be willing to, it's kind of like nursing, you know, nursing used to be so shameful, so, sh so taboo, you know, what are you doing taking your breast out in public and doing that icky female thing, and women got quite bullshy, and, you know, I, I reported on a group of mothers in Bristol who had a nursing sit-in, you know, because they were, one of them was shamed out of a cafe, so I think women have to do more of this, and so the, the, uh, the politicizing of nursing in public has been kind of successful, it's like, fuck you, I'm going to nurse my baby. You know, I have a breast, I have a baby, the baby needs to eat. I'm not going to be suppressed through disrespect. I'm not saying we need to go on a big menstrual march. <laughs> but I do think certainly among our intimate friends, I don't think it's work appropriate necessarily. You know, I think we need to treat ourselves and whatever we need with more respect for sure. Yeah. Yes, one more question. So, oh, this woman, in, okay, this woman really, really, really... It, and I'll, I'm happy to keep chatting, you know, when I'm signing, if anyone has a burning question. Uh, my name question. is Shireen. I uh, do work on sexuality in the Arab world, which is possibly not as dangerous as working on lion sexuality, <laughs> but it's still very sensitive. Um, you've got a very interesting discussion of the trajectory of good vagina, bad vagina throughout Western history. I just wanted to point out that that's un not unique to the West. In the Arab world today, for example, we don't talk about down there it's considered to be completely shameful or forbidden. And yet, if one looks at the history of Arabic erotica, a thousand years ago, we were anatomizing and analyzing 
the uh, female uh, sexual system in, in ways that were only started in the West uh, under a century ago. Did you look at any of that uh, Arabic? Uh, I erotica? did. It's steamy. <laughs> she, she's uh, Shireen. You're you're a hundred thousand percent right, and this is why you know I, I said to Scott we need we need our history back. These, these historical and cultural narratives are a really important part of our history because when you see how different cultures treat the vagina even differently in the same culture, you know, you see, you, as one reader said, I realized that you know, it was 5,000 years of a lie. Um, and so the answer is yes. First, I want to say that, um, that you're absolutely right that, that actually a lot of the Middle East practices um, clitoridectomy and uh, some, uh, you know, some African cultures practice infibulation as well. Interestingly, we in the West think that that is the end of a woman's sexual response, but there are studies that show that women, this is in no way a defense of this horrific practice, but women can continue to have orgasms because of what else is going on, but what it does is it mutes their response. So in a way, it's kind of the perfect patriarchal control. She she has some pleasure, but it's not up to her, really, and uh, it's not very much. Um, and so, yes, you're totally right that, you know, not only is it taboo, but so many of the refugees in London from those countries are fleeing s crimes that target the vagina, whether it's forced marriage, child marriage, uh, female genital mutilation, and so on, um, trafficking. But I did go back to that erotica, and y this will blow your mind, it's in the book. There's this one uh, uh, erotic text from, in Arabic, which is a minute kind of classification of like 50 different kinds of vagina. And, and you know, there's this one, which is kind of small and, and scented, and there's this one, which is you know, more like sort of a camel, or you know, this, I mean, there's like, this one's like a sunset, this one's like a peach, this one's like, you know, um, I, I mean, there, there are all these metaphors. And, and also Han Dynasty Chinese erotic poetry also like minutely looks at the differences, the variations, um, has different names, Golden Lotus, Jade Gate, um, you know, Beautiful Peony, uh, you know, minute descriptions of the lubrication and uh, it's called Amruta actually in the Hindu tradition, it's sort of sacred, sacred um, you know, liquid. So you see these other cultures that don't shy away from the vagina at all. They're not necessarily cultures in which women were completely free, but they were embracing, caring, attentive, looking at this organ very, very carefully. And what's really important in a culture like ours, which is all about labiaplasty and the porny identical vagina, hairless identical vagina, they, they were celebrating the diversity of vaginas and their needs. I mean, a lot of this erotica is about, well, this woman will need nine thrusts very deeply, and this woman likes to be touched very lightly, and you know, this woman will jump on you after a long trip, and you know, it's like, and it's, all, it's not like, and that's terrifying. It's like, and you need to know this to make her happy, right? So we can reclaim that tradition. I was told, not that exact tradition, but all of the best of these traditions. Uh, I was told I only had time for one question. Does that mean no more questions? No. <laughs> One, sorry, one more. One. She's been waiting so long. This woman in the in the orange, and then I, I, I we really will need to stop. But I'll, I'll chat away when we're. Hello. Fine. What you've said is fantastic. I do Thank sex you. education in schools. I'm a doctor. Wonderful. Also have you know children who are adolescent, and I think what you touched on, I probably didn't have time to discuss, was porn. Mm. And I think what's happening is you know 12, 13 year old boys are assuming it's a very simplistic act. Actually, there was a conference at my children's school where they discussed whether to use the words vagina and clitoris, decided not to. <gasps> a lot of parents left. This is a proper, well-known school. Oh, my God. And I think that the idea that knowledge should be out there is incredibly important. But you're saying in and sex I, education classes they weren't using the words vagina and clitoris? No. this what, was a prep what, school. What were they calling so it? <laughs> and um, then, so you move forward when they get, they get to adolescence. Right. And they have a very simplistic view. I'm not saying every school does the same thing. And you add porn in, and it's a very toxic mix, and I think the world is going backwards. Yeah. And women are being very... Um, women, 12, 13-year-old girls, are being sort of <coughs> aggressed on, yes. whatever the word, verb is, yes. through texts, through emails, through every single thing, to think that it's a simplistic act, and they are put in a compliant situation 
when they're growing up. And I, I'm very worried about it. And I don't know what you do about that in contemporary society. So it's the adolescence that yeah. worries me. I mean, adults work out what they're going to do. Yeah, right. But, well, let me, let me speak to that. First, let me just thank you so much for being in the role that you're in and for doing that work and trying to bring some raised consciousness to that incredibly important work. And what I, what I see all over North America, Western Europe, it's a global phenomenon, is just what you're describing. Um, young women, I do have a chapter on porn. It is really, really, really an important chapter because it documents the new neuroscience of how porn is addictive and how it uh, is causing health problems in men, uh, actually increasingly in women as well. Um, but young men are reporting delayed ejaculation, difficulty with orgasm, difficulty with arousal, because what porn, not watching porn, but masturbating chronically to porn, what it does is it habituates the brain to that stimulus. So you, then you need more and more uh, extreme or novel stimuli to reach the same level of arousal. And as Jim Faust says, because of that oxytocin boost, you're bonding with the porn you know, instead of with your partner. So over time, these men you know, are, are, are not as able to get aroused by their lovers, you know, and, and they're having more and more sexual difficulty. Um, and some men have a predisposition to becoming addicted to porn. And it, it, we're seeing some of the same effects in women as well. There's now a generation of women who've grown up masturbating to porn, and they too are writing in to websites that treat people with these addictions and saying, I'm really scared about myself because I can't get there without really, really extreme imagery now. So teenagers are telling me that porn addiction is the new normal. Um, I said on Women's Hour the words anal fissure yesterday, um, but it was important. Colleges are saying in America that the most common injury that girls report for or health problem is anal fissures because they're having drunken hookup sex. That's what's expected of them, but porn has boosted what's expected from you know, intercourse, that's not good enough now, or that's not intense enough, or whatever, heightened enough now, it's anal sex, and they're not ready, or they're, it's too rough. Um, and you just see this coarsening and, and heightening of stimuli where things that used to be quite marginal, like, well, you know, become the mainstream. And, and college girls say, you know, my boyfriend's addicted to it, and he says there's nothing he can do about it, and, and what do we do? Um, and, you know, it, again, it's not just a, a, a boy issue. So I think that knowing about the consequences are really important. And it's like smoking, you know. It, I don't think you can ban this stuff, but if people know what the health issues are and the effect on their relationships, they can make a choice. Um, and I also think education is really, really important. And I think high schools need to start and middle schools having programs that teach kids about constructive sexuality and constructive pleasure and what some of the dangers are out there to their sexuality in some of this imagery and habituating and you know, treating people like the imagery. Um, so if you start that program, I will support you in every way I can, you know, or any of, of you other teachers or administrators out there. Um, all right, on a happier note, thank you so much. Go out there and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.